As Mary and Joseph left Jesus in Jerusalem and went a day's journey before they discovered his being gone, then returning back to retrieve him, I want us this week to go back to Jerusalem, to return to Jerusalem, and to think about some very vital gospel truths. In our Bible study hour, we return to Jerusalem to respect the authority of the Scriptures. And I noted if we get that one right, we can build on that in everything else we do in our lives. In this worship hour, I would like us to return to Jerusalem and reflect on the Savior. If you'll open your Bibles to the second chapter of the book of Acts, we will spend a great deal of time this week looking at some principles that are found in this great chapter as we return to Jerusalem. As we reflect on the Savior, I want to mention four things. In the first place, as we reflect on the Savior, we see a valuable life. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 22, the sermon began, Men of Israel, Israelites, hear these words, and then I want you to focus in on three words. Jesus of Nazareth. A man, attested to God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as ye yourselves or you yourselves also know. We see two things when we look at this valuable life about our Savior. We notice, first of all, he was a man. And that underscores his humanity. In John chapter 1, verses 1 to 4, John begins before the beginning. When he says, in the beginning, the Word already was. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made through Him, and without Him, nothing was made that has been made. And then he moves to show that He is the light and the life of men. And he shined in the darkness, and the darkness was not able to overwhelm him. And in verse 14, the text says, And the Word became flesh, and dwelt among us. And John said, We beheld his glory as of the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. He became a man. In Philippians 2, verses 5 through 8, Paul said that Jesus was on an equality with God. But he counted that not something to be held on to, but emptied himself, taking on the form of a bond slave, being found in fashion as a man. He humbled himself, becoming obedient unto death, even the death, of the cross, His humanity. In Galatians 4 and 4, Paul said, When the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law. We need to underscore that God has has a timetable. The beginning began when it was just the right time in God's timetable. And everything from the beginning has happened according to the timetable of God. In the 15th chapter of the book of Genesis, Jehovah said to Abraham, I'm going to give your descendants the land of Canaan, but I cannot give it to them right now. And he revealed what was limiting his so doing. For the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet full. God said, I have a timetable. I'm giving these Gentiles an opportunity to repent and to come to service to me and that opportunity of long-suffering has not ended. 
But by the time you get to the 13th chapter of the book of Numbers, the iniquity of the Amorite is full. And they could have gone in and taken that land. So in Galatians 4, 4, Paul said, When the fullness of the time had come, according to God's timetable, this was when Jesus was to be born. Not before, not after. And God never missed it by any stretch of the imagination. But these apostles began, and we have Peter specifically referenced, stressing the humanity of man, the humanity of Jesus. Had He never become man, He could not have died in our stead. He had to become man to die for us. So He could, Hebrews 2, 9, taste of death for every man. He became like us. Tempted, Hebrews 4 and 12, in all points like we are, yet sinless. He did not give in to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the vainglory of life, 1 John 2, 15 to 17. He did not sin. As humanity, He did not sin. In Matthew 4, 1 through 11, and the Luke parallel in chapter 4, He met Satan eyeball to eyeball as humanity, not deity. Satan kept trying to bring the test back to deity. Since you are the Son of God, Jesus kept it on humanity. Man shall not live by bread alone. Jesus met the devil like we meet him. Jesus overcame the devil like we can overcome him. A man. But not only do you have a man, his humility, you have approved of God. The New King James says, attested by God. And there you have his humility. In Matthew 3, 13 to 17, when John the Immerser was baptizing, Jesus came to him in order to be baptized of him. John, who very likely was his cousin, would have hindered him saying, I have need that you baptize me. Why do you come to me? And Jesus said, allow it to be so now. That is, allow it to be that you baptize me. For thus it becomes us to fulfill all that is right. All righteousness. That's God's will. Then John allowed that to take place, baptized Jesus. When Jesus came up out of the water, the Holy Spirit descended like a dove would descend and lit upon Him, and heaven spoke. This is my Son, my Beloved, the one in whom I have my greatest pleasure. And why did God say that? Because Jesus had humbled Himself to God's righteous will by being baptized of John. Not because he had sin. He did not come to be baptized for the remission of sins, though that is why John was baptizing. Mark chapter 1, verse 1 and following. He came to submit to the righteous will of God. And that's what he told John. In Matthew 17, 5, on the Mount of Transfiguration, When Jesus is changed before Peter, James, and John, Moses and Elijah appear and talk about Jesus' death. And Peter becomes beside himself, apparently motivated by emotion rather than intellect. He said, Lord, it's good that we're here. Let's pitch three tents. That's what a tabernacle is. One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. See, that equaled them. That put them on an equality. And heaven interrupted. Heaven said, this is my son, my beloved, the one in whom I have my greatest pleasure. And then he added three words in the American Standard, two in the New King James. Hear him. You've already had the opportunity to hear Moses and Elijah. Their work is now done. Hear Him. Here you have Jesus, singled out by heaven, 
because he was humble enough to submit to the will of God. I submit to you as far as Jesus' earthly ministry is concerned and his ability to save us, it's all predicated on Matthew 3, 13 to 15. When Jesus submitted to the will of God, 13 to 17, he humbled himself and became obedient, even to the point of going to the cross. If you turn to the 26th chapter of the book of Matthew, you see again, and in three verses, which if I quoted, you would readily bring them to mind, but I want to get them before your eyes. In Matthew 26 and verse 39, He went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed saying, Oh my Father, if it be possible, notice, if it be possible, I'm not demanding, I'm requesting. I'm not requesting as deity, I'm requesting as humanity. If it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Now, if you mark in your Bible or you're taking notes, nevertheless is a but with a doctorate degree. It is an exaggerated contrast. If it is possible, I want the cup to pass. Nevertheless, but regardless of what I want, he said these words. Not as I will, and if I were at home, I'd say circle it, but as you will, but. Here's what I want. Nevertheless, in spite of all that, I want to do your will. I want the cup to pass from me. That's humanity. But my humility is submissive to you. I want to do your will. That's why God attested that Jesus is His Son. That's why God approved. Jesus becomes the God-approved man about whom we read in the book of Psalms. And if you'll take the time to trace the God-approved man through Psalms, you'll get a marvelous picture of Jesus and what He was when He was on this earth. So you have a valuable life. In the second place, when we go to Jerusalem and we reflect on the Savior, we see a vicarious death. Acts chapter 2 and verse 23. Notice this idea of this vicarious death. Him being delivered by the determined, you may have determinate, counsel or purpose and foreknowledge of God you have taken by lawless hands have crucified and put to death. Jesus was put to death but you read the accounts not for anything he did and when we look at the vicarious death we see two things. In the first place we see God's purpose. It was according to the purpose of God that Jesus was delivered up and put to death. I don't have time to do it. Ken can explain to you why. But this starts in Genesis 3.15. That the seed of woman will bruise the head of the serpent. And from Genesis 3.15 forward, there is a projection to the resurrection of Jesus from the dead to bruise the head of Satan. In Genesis 12 and 3, that seed of woman will come through the seed of Abraham. And while in Genesis 3.15, he is to bruise the head of the serpent, in Genesis 12.3, he is to bless all nations. In Genesis 49 and 10, he will come through the lineage of Abraham, through Judah. 
In Isaiah 7, 14, he will be born of the virgin. In Isaiah 9, 6, he will wear the titles of the supreme, the titles of deity. In Isaiah 11, 1, he will come through the lineage of Jesse, therefore through the lineage of David. In Isaiah 53, and by the way, that section begins at chapter 52, verse 13, and goes through chapter 53. You need to read that as a section, the suffering servant. He will be delivered up, and the chastisement of his peace, God's peace, will be placed upon Jesus so we can have peace. He bore our burdens on the cross. He bore our sicknesses on the cross. He bore our sins on the cross. He went to the cross for me in my place. God said it, John wrote it this way, For God so loved the world, so loved, an adverb of manner, to what degree did He love? God so loved the world, that's you and me, what, eight billion of us now? God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but should have everlasting life, John 3.16. There's a beautiful passage, I believe, in the third chapter of the book of Acts and in the 18th verse. But those things which God foretold by the mouth of A.W.L all his prophets, that the Christ would suffer. He has thus fulfilled. What does he mean by the mouth of all of his prophets? You just go through the whole Old Testament. And God was foretelling that the Christ would suffer and now it's been fulfilled. God commended his own love toward us. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5, 8 and 9. That's a commendation of the love of God. That's a restating of John 3, 16. God so loved us that even when we were sinners, Christ died for us. He tasted death for, in the place of, every man. Hebrews 2 and verse 9. I deserve to die. The wages of sin is death. Romans 6, 23. Sin leads to death, James 1.15. In the day you eat thereof, dying you shall surely die, Genesis 2.16.17. But Jesus said, I'll take His place. And God said, if you take His place and He obeys the gospel, I can apply your blood to His soul and you can have died in His stead. 1 John 2 and 2. John had begun by saying, My little children, I write these things to you that you may not sin. That's the ideal. You may not commit a single act of sin. But then he came to reality and he said, And if anyone sins, which we do, Romans 3 and 23, all accountable beings, we have an advocate, a defense attorney, with the Lord. We have an advocate with the Father. Who is he? Jesus Christ the righteous. And He is the propitiation. Jawbreaker for English speakers. A propitiation for our sins. Not ours only. The whole world. What in the world is a propitiation? It's a substitute. In this case, an accepted substitute that met the demands of violated justice that was acceptable to God. Let me see if I can illustrate propitiation. In the 22nd chapter of the book of Genesis, God said to Abram, Take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, to one of the mountains of Moriah that I will show you and offer him there for a holocaust. A burnt offering. Burned up. 
You take Isaac, for whom you've waited all this time, the apple of your eye, the one you love, your beloved, and you burn him to a crisp as a burnt offering. The text says Abraham rose early in the morning. I, when I was a boy preacher, I missed this whole thing. I used to say, if there was ever a time to procrastinate, that would have been it. But you see, Abraham's looking from a different viewpoint. Hebrews eleven nineteen. Abraham has worked this thing out in his mind. Now, he worked it out wrong, but this is what he believes. So the way he's thinking, there's no problem getting up early in the morning. Let's go get this thing done. It's going to work out right. His picture was, I'm going to take him to the mountain. I'm going to burn him to a crisp. God's going to put him back together, and we're going to come home together. That's the way Abraham had worked it out. That wasn't the way it happened. They got there. Isaac is on the altar. Abraham draws the knife back to kill him. One fellow said if there had been an angel standing by the side of God, he would have said, that old man's going to kill that boy. And he would have. But the angel of Jehovah stopped him. Stay your hand. Now I know that you've not withholden the very most precious thing in your life from me, your son. But by implication... It wasn't Isaac on that altar. It was Abraham. Abraham put himself on that altar. I will submit to the will of God regardless. Now here's how I think it'll work out, but that's up to God. I'm in total submission. And there's a ram caught in the thicket. And the text says, Abraham took that ram and offered him, now if you mark in your Bible, instead of, you may have in the stead of, Isaac. Instead of is propitiation. Isaac was to be a burnt offering, but Isaac didn't die. The ram died. The ram took Isaac's place on that altar. There was still a burnt offering. But it was Isaac on the altar, and then the ram on the altar, and the ram took Isaac's place. That's the idea of propitiation. So you have God's purpose all the way through. The second part of this vicarious death is the Jews' part. And according to verse 36, the Jews took by lawless hands Jesus and crucified him and put him to death. In Acts 3, 13 to 15, and again in verse 17, Peter will say the exact thing, the same thing. Your rulers and ignorance put him to death. You kill the prince of life. You denied the Holy One of God, the just One of God. You put Him to death. And in verse 17, He says, Yet now, brethren, I know that you did it in ignorance. Didn't excuse it, but you did it in ignorance. And it was willful ignorance because they had willfully rejected the Old Testament that pointed Him out to be the Messiah. In Acts chapter 5 and verse 30, again we read, The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. When Peter stood before Cornelius in Acts chapter 10 and verse 39, we are witnesses of all these things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they killed by hanging on a tree. You have God's purpose all the way through, but you have the Jews' part in this also, because they rejected God's will, they rejected God's revelation, they killed the Messiah. And he died in my place, a vicarious death. When we return to Jerusalem to reflect on the Savior, we see a victorious resurrection. 
In verses 24 through 32, you killed him, you crucified him, but God raised him up. And he goes to explain how the grave could not hold on to Jesus. He used the Old Testament to do that. And in this victorious resurrection, you see two things. In the first place, you see God's power and proof. In Matthew 27, 62 through chapter 28 and verse 6, Jesus is in the tomb, but the tomb cannot hold him. You remember they even sealed it with a Roman seal. They put a guard outside to be sure the disciples didn't steal the body. Matthew 28, 11 to 15, here are the things that tra- <coughs> excuse me, transpired. The power of God. A great earthquake. A stone so big the women were concerned about how we're going to get that stone away so we can anoint the body. But that was not a problem for God. An angel came and rolled it away. The power of God. But that also was the proof of God. In Luke 24 and 46, Jesus said to the disciples, again trying to open their mind to the scriptures, trying to remind them, all of this was told you and was written. Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. Up from the grave he arose. Victory over his foes. In Acts 17, 1 to 3 we see Paul opening the scriptures and out of them proving that Jesus of Nazareth is the one who fulfilled these scriptures as the Messiah. And then in Romans 1, 4, Paul declares, He is declared to be the Son of God by the resurrection. That's God's power. That's God's proof. Up from the grave He arose. So you see God's power and proof. In the second place, you see the apostles preaching. They were to preach as witnesses, John 15, 26 and 27. In Acts 1, 8, you're going to be witnesses. You're going to be my witnesses. In Acts 3 and 15, here you have the apostles giving their witness to the resurrection. In Acts 5, 30 to 32, you see the apostles preaching this resurrection from the dead. This is their message. In Acts 17, verse 18, you have the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. And there's a whole chapter in 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, showing that God raised Jesus from the dead as proof that I'm going to come out of that grave. John 5, 28 and 29, when we hear the voice of the Savior, we will come out of that grave. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 5, 11, we will be caught up in air to meet the Lord in air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And that's the preaching of the apostles. That's our preaching. Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. He was buried. He was raised from the dead according to the Scriptures. And He gave proof to that resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15, 1-8. A victorious resurrection. And in just a few minutes, we're going to remember that death. without which we could not be saved. But had He stayed in the tomb, He would not be our Savior. When we return to Jerusalem and reflect on the Savior, we see a validated reign. Acts 2, 33 
through 36. And when we look at the validated reign of the Son of God, we see two things. We see, number one, He was exalted. And this is just mentioned over and over and over again in the Scriptures. Acts 5, 30 to 32, talk about His exaltation. Ephesians 1, 15 to 23, he's exalted by God even to the point of being made head of the church. He's over all things to the church. Philippians 2, 9 through 11, God's given him a name above every name. Such exaltation. There's a beautiful rendition of this in 1 Timothy 3. And verse 16, as Paul reassured Timothy of the great mystery, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among Gentiles, believed on in the world, Received up in glory. Looking unto Jesus, the author, the source, and the completer of our faith, the finisher, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, having despised the shame, and sat down on the right hand of God. The same point is reiterated in Hebrews chapter 1. Exalted to glory. May we never forget the ascension and how important the ascension of Jesus is. But not only do we see him exalted, we see him enthroned. And ladies and gentlemen, he's ruling and reigning on the throne of David right now, which is the church, Psalms 110.1. He is not coming back to this earth to set up a kingdom. He will never set foot on this earth again. His kingdom's in heaven, on the throne of God, the throne of David, which are the same, by the right hand of God. In Isaiah 9, 6, when you look at those titles, if you please, that he would fit, Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Father of Eternity, the Prince of Peace. Daniel 7, 13 and 14, Daniel said, One came to the Ancient of Days, and he was given dominion. He was given this kingdom. Zechariah 6, 12 and 13, Zechariah talked about this enthronement of Jesus. And if we had time to just dissect Hebrews 1, 1 to 14, you see him seated on the right hand of God and there he rules and reigns until he delivers this kingdom back to God. 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 25. We return to Jerusalem and we reflect on this Savior. A valuable life. He lived sinlessly. A vicarious death. He took my place on the cross because He lived that valuable life. But He didn't stay in the grave. A victorious resurrection. Up from the grave He arose. Seated on the right hand of God, ruling and reigning as King of kings, Lord of all who are lords, head of the church, which is His body. And that reign is validated by God Himself. If you obey the plan of salvation, you begin by looking at the testimony of the apostles, looking at the testimony of the inspired scriptures. He is the Christ, the Son of God. Faith in Him can only come by hearing God's Word. Romans 10 verse 17. You come to without a doubt believe because of evidence. He is the Christ, the Son of the living God. John 8 24 you'll immediately change your mind about living in sin on purpose. You know you can't please Him and do what you want to do. You'll get out of the sinning business on purpose. It's called repentance. 
God commands it of all men everywhere. Acts 17.30 You will make with your lips the good confession. I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God made by the eunuch in Acts 8.37 You will be buried with Him in the waters of baptism but you won't stay in the grave. Up from the grave you will arise to walk in newness of life. Romans 6, 1-4 You are a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 You are a new man in Christ. Colossians 3, 5-17 So as Christ died and was buried, you died to the practice of sin. You are buried in the waters of baptism. As Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, you are raised from the waters of baptism to walk a new lifestyle and to walk it faithfully. Revelation 2 verse 10. And when as a Christian we sin and we do because we're weak and immature as our brother prayed for strength in our weakness, we must repent of those sins and ask God to forgive us. Acts 8, 22 to 24. One more time, this side of eternity. We come back to see in the authority of the Scriptures a Savior. Christ the Lord. Is He your Savior? We want to help Him be while we stand and we encourage.